Hello again, everyone. My name is Lauren Bizaki, and I'm one of your teaching assistants for this Coursera course entitled Constitutional Law. Now, you've had two bonus features so far where my other teaching assistants, Daniel and Danny, have answered some of your questions from the forum. And I've taken the opportunity to do the exact same thing. I combed through this most recent week's forums discussing the lecture material, and I chose a few questions that I thought were particularly important to address in this office hours bonus material. So I'll go to the first question. One of your classmates, Johan Kiering, asks, what is supreme, state constitution or federal law? What is supreme, state constitution or federal treaties? So really, he's asking two questions. First, whether federal law and federal, first, whether federal law would trump a state constitution, and second, whether a federal treaty would trump a state constitution. And the answer to both is the same. The federal law and federal treaty will always trump a state constitution. So that's the short answer. But now I'm going to take a few minutes to walk you through why and to explain some of the issues and exciting features of our system of legal hierarchy of laws. So I've prepared a slide that outlines the different types of laws that we have in our country. And if you take a look at this slide, you'll see at the very top is the Constitution. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And as such, it will always trump any of the other types of laws that you see below it. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail later on explaining why. But I want you to notice that it's at the top and that no one disagrees about the supremacy of this document. So next, below the Constitution, you'll see federal statutes. And what federal statutes are, are laws that are passed by the Federal Congress, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, and then signed into law by the President. Below federal statutes, you'll see treaties. Treaties are unique in that it does not require both houses to pass a treaty. Treaties cut out the House of Representatives from the treaty-making process. And so that is where the federal type of laws end. And the next two we see are related to states. And that's state constitutions followed by state laws. Now what you'll notice on the side, the right side of that slide, is that there's an arrow pointing up saying more democratic. And what that means is that these laws, the supremacy of these laws that is, are arranged based on how democratic they are. So you'll see at the top, the Constitution, that is the most democratic law that we have on any, in any of our books, whether it's state or federal, in our nation. And why is that? Well, it's for the exact same reasons that we've been discussing throughout this course and the earlier lectures. The Constitution was ordained by the people. That is, it was ratified by the states. And in those state ratifying conventions, we had even lower property requirements than we did to vote for other laws. The Constitution was not established by a small number of legislators, but rather the entire nation. So as such, it's the most democratic form of law. And as you go down, the laws become less democratic. And what I mean by less democratic is that they're less representative of the people. So for instance, I just discussed how treaties cut out the House of Representatives. And it's commonly noted that the House of Representatives is the people's branch of government. And then all the way down at the bottom, state laws cut out all the people in those other 49 states. And they're established by state legislatures. And so as you can see, at the very top, we have a more democratic law, and we go down from there. Now this hierarchy of democracy is important to the supremacy of these laws. And Professor Amar, in his chapter about the law of the land, the lecture that you just watched, outlines in great detail in his America's Constitution, a biography book, all of the arguments for why this hierarchy of laws is true, and one of those being this gradient of democracy. I did just want to highlight for you that there is debate about whether federal statutes or federal treaties trump one another. That is, what happens when a federal statute on one hand 
and a federal treaty, on the other hand, conflict. Now, under this, under this slide, under this gradient we see, Professor Amar would answer that indeed the federal statute would trump the treaty. However, there is scholarly debate as well as judicial indecisiveness about what would happen in that case. Now, the, the majority of the judicial branch doesn't have a clear consensus about whether a statute or a treaty would trump one another based on those distinctions. And Professor Amar argues in his chapter of this book that the judicial branch thus is being unfaithful to the Constitution. And Professor Amar outlines a number of arguments for why this hierarchy, specifically statutes trumping treaties, should be followed by the courts and is true to our Constitution. And I'm not going to go into all of those arguments, but I just wanted to take time to highlight a few of those so you understand some of the, the points that are in dispute and some of the working parts um, behind this question of the Supremacy Clause. So if we take a look at the Supremacy Clause itself in the Constitution, which is found in Article 6, it states, this Constitution, so it's stating the Constitution first, and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, so second, it mentions these federal laws, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, so next it mentions treaties, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So the last part of Article 6, of this paragraph of Article 6, then mentions the state. Now what Professor Amar argues is that this uh, order that is outlined in the Constitution, the Constitution, federal statutes, treaties, and then state law, is important for our understanding of supremacy. That is, the Supremacy Clause itself outlines the order of the supremacy of the laws. And he makes a doctrinal point about why we should accept this argument. And I'm going to read now from his chapter. For those of you that are following along, it's page 303. And Professor Amar argues, in Marbury v. Madison, Chief Justice Marshall, in emphasizing the legal priority of the Constitution, deemed it not entirely unworthy of observation that Article VI Supremacy Clause listed the Constitution first. Isn't it likewise worthy of notice that this very same clause listed federal statutes ahead of federal treaties, thereby implying a rank order between the two? So that's just uh, a little introduction to some of the arguments surrounding the Supremacy Clause and, and the debate about whether statutes or treaties trump one another when they're in direct conflict. I'd like now to move on to a second question I found in the discussion forums for this week's lectures. And this comes from someone named Dominic. Dominic asks, in the lecture, the professor mentioned that if enough states decide they can request Congress to call a proposing convention. I don't think the professor explained how many states constitute enough states. Please explain. So the amendment process for the Constitution is outlined in Article 5 of the Constitution, right next to Article 6 that we were just discussing uh, about the Supremacy Clause. And Article 5 of the Constitution, I'm not going to read it out loud. It's kind of long, and there's a lot of ors. There's a lot of different clauses. There's a lot going on there. And so I prepared a slide to help kind of break it down and explain the amendment process a little bit better. So the amendment process is a two-step process. And any amendment requires that both of these steps be met before the Constitution can be amended. So the first step is that amendments may be adopted and sent to the states for ratification by one of two mechanisms. So either of these two mechanisms would allow the amendment to be adopted and then sent to the states. 
So the first mechanism is that two-thirds of the Senate and the House of Representatives must propose to adopt this amendment. And that's known as a supermajority. So it requires both houses of the legislature, two-thirds, not the normal 50% or the normal majority required, but a supermajority, which is much more difficult to achieve and often requires uh, the help of both parties and the support of both parties. Or, now this is an or, not an and, or a national convention assembled at the request of the legislature of at least two-thirds of the states. And now this is what Dominic was asking about. So currently, two-thirds of the states would be 34 states. And 34 states would have to request this national convention. The last national convention we had was the ratification convention for the initial constitution itself. It has been hundreds of years before we've had a national convention. Now, just because states aren't uh, requiring this national convention to propose amendments doesn't mean that it's not a powerful clause of this article of the constitution. Just the threat that states have the power to make Congress do something has had effects in Congress proposing amendments that they knew the state wanted. That is, if a lot of states were threatening this huge national convention to uh, create an amendment for the Constitution, Congress can heed those threats and can themselves instead, under a two-third supermajority, propose these amendments. And so we haven't seen uh, any of these uh, st national constitutions yet. None of the 27 amendments that we have now have taken that path. It is a possibility. Okay, so after we clear step one of the two-step process for constitutional amendment, then there's a second step. So the second step is that the amendment must be ratified. And it must be ratified again in one of two different ways. And the Constitution, Article 5, actually outlines that Congress can decide which of these two ways the amendment must be ratified. So it gives Congress that authority. So the first way that the amendment can be ratified is that the legislatures of three-fourths of the state, which is again, thir uh, excuse me, three-fourths of the states, which in this case is 38 states, can ratify the amendment. Or the second is that state ratifying conventions in three-fourths of the state, which is again 38 states, can ratify the amendment. And so you see a difference there between the legislature and the state ratifying conventions. Now the legislature being a group of elected officials, uh, much like our federal House of Representatives and Senate, but at the state level. Now, we only have one instance where Congress mandated that the state ratifying convention of three-fourths of the states ratify the amendment. And in this case, that's the 21st Amendment, which became part of the Constitution in 1933. To date, that is the only amendment that we have that required the state ratifying conventions. So as you can see by this two-step process, Article 5 mandates a process that is not entirely left to Congress. That is, we don't want to give Congress the ability to change the Constitution entirely on its own. And people have wondered, why wouldn't we want to do that? Well, one hypothetical that really illustrates this point is that Congress could amend the Constitution on their own to say that we're not going to have an, another election in four years or we're not going to give up our seats in Congress. We are the perpetual Congress. And they could take out the Republican form of government clause and do all of these things. And sure, there would be a public outcry, but if we allowed Congress to amend the Constitution on its own, we would be giving a significant amount of authority to that lawmaking body. And so as you can see, the two-step process for constitutional amendments requires the help, really, of people in the states, whether it be the legislatures or the state ratifying conventions. And without that consensus, amendments don't happen in America. 
you know, some scholars have said that the amendment process is too difficult, while others have actually um, rejoiced in this difficulty of amendment, these two-third requirements and the Congress and the states, because we have a we have a document and it's difficult to change. And some argue that many of the great things of our document then are difficult to change and they are not exposed to the political pressures of existing Congresses. So those were the two questions from the recent material that I thought were really interesting to consider and that a lot of you were wondering about. I encourage you to find the original posts. Uh, maybe we can even link to them from this video if you have further thoughts on the issues. As I said, this was really just a brief cursory overview of the Supremacy Clause and some of the debates and arguments surrounding it and the um, Article 5 procedure for constitutional amendment. And there are certainly m uh, many more aspects of each of these articles to explore between uh, each other on the discussion board. And I know that in all the posts I've seen so far, um, many of you have a great handle on the Constitution already and have been really invaluable help for your fellow classmates in helping outline some of the issues that we've talked about today and other issues as well. So this ends our office hours for today. If you have questions, make sure to keep posting them. We will be going through the discussion boards and replying, as well as taking some of the questions and answering them on screen for you like, like I did today. Thank you and have a great day. Mm -hmm.